four. Thanks, Winifred, and you and yours is at four minutes past twelve. Before that, on Radio 4, the final part of the series, follow-up albums. The music journalist Pete Perfides investigates the stories behind three albums that followed their very successful predecessors. This week we hear about Dog Man Star, the second album of the band Suede. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. things considered, 1992 was not a great time for British guitar music. The indie dance vanguard spearheaded by the Stone Roses and Happy Mondays had run its course. And Britpop? Well, that was little more than a nameless idea in Damon Albarn's head. As a result, almost all hopes for homegrown indie music rested on the shoulders of just one band, Suede. Within a year of their first single, they had won the second ever Mercury Music Prize for their eponymous album. The cult of Suede centred around the chemistry between a flamboyant singer, Brett Anderson, and a prodigiously talented guitarist, Bernard Butler. The story of their 1994 album, Dogman Star, is also the story of the impact that success had upon that chemistry. Singer Brett Anderson. Before we met Bernard, we were very theoretical about it. And Bernard came at it from a very different point of view. You know, he was very, very capable and craftsmanlike about the way he played the guitar. And it was exactly the huge piece of jigsaw that, that we were missing. Suede guitarist Bernard Butler. He was just really happy fella, just like, all right, just standing the stairs, a really nice warm smile. It didn't take long for Suede's new guitarist to sideline their old one. Future Elastica singer Justine Frischman left Suede and, more pertinently, left Brett for another charismatic frontman, Blur's Damon Albarn. You know, when you split up with anyone, it's kind of, it's always very traumatic and Bernard really helped me through that period as a friend and we were very close and he gave me something to write about. The fallout from Justine's departure effectively transformed Suede, and gradually the wider world began to take note. Melody Maker famously placed Suede on their cover, their billing the best new band in Britain. We've been playing to two people in toilets for a number of years. It was the longest overnight success story ever but when it did finally happen yeah it was amazing because you know we were you know i was on the dole there really was this kind of huge adulation around you yeah yeah I mean, it was crazy i mean it was it was proper hysteria suede guitarist bernard butler i was just struck with absolute panic stations about all of that i just didn't enjoy it it just struck fear in me as suede's publicist phil savage found himself in the eye of the hurricane we were having fun with it because the press was out of control. I got 18 front covers before the, the first album came out. They were on the cover of Hugh after two singles. It was a, a quite a fun time to be a press officer for a very happening band. While Bernard worried, Brett eased into newfound celebrity like someone born to the role. The press did latch on so heavily to Brett and the things that he was saying. They became obsessed with him almost. And I've, I've got a feeling that possibly... Bernard was put off by that. First couple of interviews, I sat there and the focus uh, came on Brett and he started talking about things like uh, big words like androgyny, which I'd never heard of before and I'd had no understanding of it. I'd, I went to a boys' Catholic school and that was that. I was like, whoa, what's this about? So after the first few interviews, I just start, we all started saying, you know what, let's just let, let him do it. Bernard wanted to do more serious press. He wanted to do just press uh, to do with Guitarist magazine and Guitar magazine and nothing frivolous. I grew up on New Order, a band who never did press, who never played on the radio, and kept their integrity throughout everything. Someone, 
your debut album came out and it was the best selling debut album since Welcome to the Pleasure Dome by Frankie Goes to Hollywood. <laughs> oh, yeah. Were you enjoying it or was it pressure to keep the momentum? My Catholic guilt brought on me a feeling that, well, if somebody said we're the best new band in Britain, I kind of have to prove it. And if we are the best selling album, then, oh my God, what if the next one isn't? By all accounts, the American tour was really when the partying seemed to begin in earnest. Yeah, it did. Sometimes going crazy on the road is the only way to get through it. Suede bassist Matt Osman. Touring America is, is quite extreme. The extreme travel and the cheap drugs and just the, the nuttiness of it, really. It all gets a bit out of hand. Bernard Butler. For me, it wasn't a party, no. I mean, we all were partying a little bit, but in my life, it wasn't really like that, no. If Bernard had already been feeling conflicted about Swade's sudden success, the news that back home his father was critically ill distanced him even further from the rest of the band. My dad died two days after we went on tour. I came home, went to a funeral, went back on the plane and went back on tour. And uh, that was sort of a bonkers thing to do, really. And the new people that come into my life were just, you know, badly behaved, decadent people. I just thought there was sort of dark powers at work, you know. It definitely messed up my head. Cracks appeared in the kind of relationships in the band. We should have just cancelled the tour, you know. We should have given Bernard time to mourn and to grieve. I was too young to be able to respond properly to it and to kind of give it the respect that I should have given it. The only thing I wanted, I wanted to have a relationship and it was just impossible really at that time with, uh, with Brett because I was spoiling the party in every way. Swade duly set about turning a crisis into a drama. What Brett and Bernard weren't able to say to each other in person was played out on stage. Matt Osman. There was a New York show we did. It was a straightforward battle between Brett and Bernard on stage. You know what I mean? For the soul of, of the band. The record company wouldn't come backstage afterwards. And kind of like one of them stuck his head around the door like half an hour later going, Are you guys okay? It's great. The almost humorous tragedy of being in a band, especially if you've seen Spinal Tap, is that there's always one member who starts travelling with the crew. And that was you, wasn't it, in this case? Yeah, I just didn't want any luxury around. So all day long I sat in a bus for five hours playing guitar and writing songs. And what I didn't know is Brett was writing lyrics during this time as well. When you sort of arrived back in London, how did the writing proceed? For Dogman Stud. It's kind of a myth that we, we sort of did everything by post and stuff. We did a bit like that, but it was more just convenience than anything else, you know. But I don't really think at that time there was mad hatred going on or something like that. There was periods for a couple of weeks when we wouldn't speak, and that was because I assumed that he was just off his nut or something. Having produced Swade's first album, Ed Buller was now faced with the onerous task of bringing out the best from a partnership that appeared to be falling apart before him. It is a marriage. There has to be mutual respect and understanding and empathy. There has to be some form of affection. And that, that had completely gone by the time we started Dogman and Star. Brett Anderson. You're talking about me and Bernard, our relationship sort of falling apart slightly, personally, but professionally, we weren't in a funny sort of way. And I still felt very, very strongly that we could together make something amazing. What kind of a record did you think this was going to be? Well, I wanted the album to be sprawling and tortured and epic but essentially i wanted it to be a collection of great songs no pressure then <laughs> well yeah the beauty of the, uh, of making dogman star was th that suede had been so successful that we didn't have to listen to anyone as a result suede put aside all commercial considerations and set about alchemizing the madness of the last 12 months fame excess, paranoia, enmity and grief into one toweringly ambitious record, Dogman Star. First song was going to be introducing the band, so you get the drums first, then you get the guitar, then you get the, the vocal, then you get the bass, you know, so it introduces every element of the band, you know, musically. It was actually inspired by, during the touring of the first album, we went to Japan 
and I got taken to this temple in Kyoto, this Buddhist temple, and these monks were, were doing these amazing kind of mantras, these chants. With Brett rarely surfacing in the daytime, Bernard looked to Swade's drummer, Simon Gilbert, to help him flesh out his new ideas. Brett wasn't there when we were laying down a lot of the tracks, so it's just me and Simon recording. Where was Brett? Um, I don't know, at home, I guess. I don't know, yeah. I mean, that's just the way it was. He was just living by night at the time. Yes, yeah, we would, you know, it's, we probably slipped into sort of opposite lifestyles, really. When we were recording Dogman Star, I remember he'd be playing the guitar parts during the day and then dinner time would come around and he'd go back home and then I'd come in, you know. Producer, Ed Buller. Bernard was just always playing. He was always picking up an instrument and playing, quite often playing an instrument that wasn't his first instrument. Um, I remember him buying a synthesizer when we were making Dogman Star and being <laughs> blown away and somewhat irritated at how quickly he got great noises out of it. He was just naturally very, very musical. I just set myself loads of tasks. Like I was, I was thinking, OK, we are a band, but if I don't want to have drummers in a song, just because we've got a drummer doesn't mean we should have drummers in the song. How would you explain that to Simon, Simon Gilbert, the drummer? Yeah, yeah, you can imagine. How did I explain that? Yeah, probably not very well. With a clear idea of the kind of songs he wanted to write, Brett Anderson looked for an appropriately grand environment in which to write them. I moved to Highgate, to this enormous kind of gothic mansion, and it was owned by a religious sect called the Mennonites. You know, I'd be sitting there kind of off my head writing and doing mad things, and you could hear the, them singing hymns, you know, emanating through the walls. Your life at this point seems to have taken on a kind of Byronic grandeur. Yes. You know, the way that your personality is distorted through the lens of the media and then reflected back to you. That whole process, I'd been kind of rearranging my persona, and yes, you're right, there was a definitely a kind of dissolute, sort of madman approach to the whole thing. Yeah. In the steeples, all I ever do, That house had a lot to do with them. the lyrics that Brett was writing at the time. It was a spooky place to live in, and I think he wanted to be totally alone. Around this time, there were a few photo sessions, one with Jean-Baptiste Mondino for ID magazine, where I had to go around and get him to a photo session at, at nine in the morning, and I went round at eight, and there was no answer at the door, and I kept banging and banging, and then eventually I broke in through the bathroom window and went into the living room, where Brett had emerged in a dressing gown pretending that he'd slept all night, whereas I think he just put a dressing gown on to show that he was, you know, ready for his photo session. Do you remember a particular day when Phil Savage attempted to climb through your window? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I do, yeah. It's kind of fair. Yeah, I've I'd, I'd been partying the night before. <laughs> that was pretty much what every day was like in those days. In spite, or perhaps because of the fact that they were barely on speaking terms, performances in the studio scaled new peaks of emotion. The Two of Us is an interesting song because I think it's actually lyrically the key song on the record is a lot about personal disintegration and kind of like isolation from society and from friends and, you know, parallels with my relationship with Bernard and, you know, I was going through mentally quite a sort of strange period in my life. I remember Bernard playing the, the piano part and he played it in a very beautiful but very, very pained way. Lying in my bed Watching my mistakes I listen to the pan They said that it could be the two of us Wild Ones is my single favourite song I've ever written. It just hits that right note between bitterness and sweetness. We recorded that sitting on the roof of my dad's car outside the studio at Master Rock, which is one of those stupid things. Just thought, you know what, it's sunny and I really want to record it outside so you can hear the cars. There's a song playing on the radio. Sky high in the airways 
on the morning of your We have to talk about the Asphalt World, which I guess it had the album not turned out to be such an extraordinary record, people would have been talking in terms of your hubris and t citing that song as an example. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Another millimetre in the wrong direction and that song would have been laughed at for being overblown. Bernard was insisting at that point on the guitar solo for Asphalt World being 20 minutes long. You know, that was such a bad start. Basically, I wanted to stand in the room with Simon and just play, and I wanted it to be sort of an emotional sort of force between us. Simon's one of the only members of the band who sort of kind of displays his irritation, obviously. And um, I think he was just fed up. What did Simon do then? Feeling he threw a stick at him, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah, and this is a kind of a big myth about this, that I wanted every song to be 18 minutes long and stuff, which has been really unfair, because in the case of the Asphalt World, the whole idea was to leave this massive soundscape in the middle to see what he wanted to do with it or what we could do with it. But I wasn't seeing Brett an awful lot by the time he was doing the vocals, so I, I didn't get to have that conversation. As Brett prepared to record the vocal, an interview appeared in Vox Music Monthly, which further served to alienate Bernard from Suede. Yeah, I mean, he was kind of commenting on, on our relationship and criticising me as a, the way I worked and things like that, which I found very hurtful. And that was kind of a flashpoint. And the kind of iciness and the pain in that vocal performance was a reaction to that interview. Ride in a taxi to the Did you sense that your position in the band was becoming untenable? Yeah, I just felt like none of them liked me, really. <laughs> I just didn't think anyone wanted me there, you know. But at the same time, I was there all day in the studio. I, I didn't want to leave the studio. I, I had a little corner of the studio set up with, like, a TV, sofa, guitars all around me, every keyboard I could imagine, everything set up. I just wanted to absolutely live there. Maybe part of the problem was that you were ready to at least have a hand in producing the record. Yeah, it was, it was kind of edging around that, but technically, no, I wasn't in any way. I had no idea what I was doing. Everything was just pouring out of me at the time music. It was just absolutely pouring out, and, you know, I didn't want to be stopped. Uh, which was a problem, I guess, for Ed Buller, who was producing the record. Yeah, it would probably be a nightmare. If I was with someone like that now, it would probably be a living nightmare, to be honest. Saul Galpern was the head of Suede's record label, Nude. Ed was very opinionated and made sure that he got his opinions out as to how he felt. But I think that came from being passionate and believing in the band. And I just think Bernard felt uncomfortable with it and just didn't want to work with him. So there was an issue, quite a big issue. Producer, Ed Buller. I can remember on many occasions pushing down the talk about going, right, you ready? Not hearing anything. Bernard, can you hear me? Complete silence. Bernard. And he'd be, you know, catatonic. What's the matter? You know, and they just start ranting. And it was like this day in, day out. It was awful. Sounds like he was kind of in what might be called depression. Yeah, I think he was having a breakdown. I think when his dad had died, he was in this big band, he was under a lot of pressure to write a record with people he hated. He had convinced himself that we were all, you know, in various forms the Antichrist. We didn't understand him. He was just in a rotten state. While I was in the band and right up to that point, it was a relatively happy time, even when I didn't realise that everything was holding in on me. Because during this time of recording, it was a fantastic time. You know, I was absolutely on fire in a, in a way that I'll never be again, I don't think. I think I'd kind of essentially become a bit scared of him. You know, we'd both sort of demonised each other a little bit. As Bernard Butler saw it, one thing stood between him and his determination to get Dogman Star sounding the way he wanted it to, and that was Ed Buller. Suede's guitarist presented his band with a risky ultimatum. Yeah, I had a bust up with Ed Buller. And I remember calling in the manager and um, the label and just actually everyone said, you know what, no one's on your side. Actually we're siding with him. And I remember having a meeting with Brett and Brett was the same. He was like, none of it's going to go your way. 
and I, yeah, I, I, I absolutely made uh, put down a stupid gamble of just like it's me or him, and everyone said instantly him, and so meaning Ed Bullock. Ed Bullock yeah. I kind of called his bluff back and said, right, well, it's Ed then. It was possibly one of the stupidest things I've ever done, looking back on it. To jeopardise mine and Berner's relationship and to throw it away like that was utterly unforgivable. I don't I just thought, well, they don't want me around, and it was really devastating. I had no interest in leaving, getting out, or ending this thing that, that I'd begun. You know, it's my baby. A holiday would have sorted some of it out, surely. I don't know what would sort it out, really. I mean, I was probably, you know, completely off my nut as well, and not behaving in, a, in an appropriate way, but. I was just in complete shock that people would just so readily say, yeah, they don't want me to be in band. The period when Bernard actually left the band, you know, it was a relief and, you know, there was that sort of, like, weird period of almost elation because the, the pressure, the uncomfortable atmosphere within the band had been a really, really crushing presence for a long time. Looking back on it, picking him up the phone and, and talking to him and, and going around to his house and having a cup of tea with him would have been a huge way to have kept him in suede, but I was too dumb to realise at the time, and I regret it. A shell-shocked Bernard Butler was faced with the prospect of one last heartbreaking journey to the Kilburn studio, where suede had been recording Dogman Star. He went to the studio and he wasn't allowed into the studio. I think he'd had a conversation where he was going to come and pick his guitars up, and then I heard that he arrived at the studio and his guitar was in the corridor, or not in the studio. They were put in reception because he rang up and said, can you put my guitars in reception because I want to use them. So we did, and this turned into his guitars being left in the street. It was just horrible because you just knew all the time that the car had driven off and you could see it going further and further into the distance and you'd just been dropped off uh, in the middle of the, the road. Yeah, it just felt, I don't know, God, rubbish, you know. With the sessions for Dogman Star awaiting completion, Suede was suddenly without their guitarist and co-writer. Unfortunately, the one track that really needed a lot of work was the power. And we hired this guitar player, a top, top session player, and he just could not play this part. He could play the notes, he could do the bends in the same spot, but where he played it, it just sounded kind of cheesy. And when Bernard played it, it sounded wonderful. <laughs> If you're far over Africa On the wings of you Swade quickly set about enlisting a new guitarist, 17-year-old Richard Oakes, to play Bernard's parts on the group's imminent tour. We were very bullish about kind of just replacing Bernard with another guitar player and the band became a different band. Dogman Star came out in October 1994. By the time it appeared Blur had released Park Life and Oasis were riding high with Definitely Maybe. The gothic grandeur of Suede's second album was surplus to the zeitgeist requirements. It was the wrong record wasn't it? <laughs> Yeah, it was completely out of step. It was beautifully out of step. I love that, you know, as soon as this sort of beery Britpop cartoon was, was starting to form in 1994, that Suede suddenly released a record that was tortured and, and sexual and songs about isolation and disintegration. Brett wanted the first single to be called We Are The Pigs, whereas I didn't think people went into record shops and said the word pigs because it was an ugly word. There were so many beautiful tracks in the record to release that song was um, an act of, you know, um, rebellion, really. You're enjoying your power. Yeah, I suppose there was a little bit of, you know, 
felt like I was become some sort of medieval king. <laughs> Imposing my whim. <laughs> no, it didn't fit in because I think people expected it to be a pop record. I mean, I actually think it's the first ecstasy fueled rock record. Like any other outsider, Bernard had to rely on the music press to find out what the group were doing. It was just, just really surreal, just something I wouldn't want any young person to go through. Mm. And uh, yeah, it was devastating for years. For years? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely for years. I mean, it still is devastating to me that I never played those songs and celebrate it in a way. There's a song playing on the radio. If I had to present one record at the pearly gates that would be it I'd say I did make this because it's just an extraordinary record you know it got through all the grief I just wanted to make something that was completely different completely individual completely unexpected not trying to be commercial you know something that you you dive inside and you can just close your eyes and it's a whole world in there was it a wise thing to carry on with the name suede i don't know the option i suppose was to say the suede is over and to start a new band but do you think that might have given you scope to return to that formation at a later point? It might have been a better way to have done it, yeah. Do you mean that, you know, because there's a suede that's in existence now, it continues to sort of keep Bernard out? Yeah, I do think that, yeah, there's that sense that coming back into the band would be much too complicated a process for him to think about. <laughs> idea really when there's a band that's existed for 20 years without me <laughs> so it's not absolutely nothing to do with me I can see it happening one day there's the, the mm. collective appetite to see that lineup of suede mm. perform those songs I also think that when you know when we were recording these songs doing that kind of thing was illegal it was the worst thing in the world to see a bunch of old farts getting back together and that was one of the, the ethics that we had that set us apart of course, you're now a you know, sought-after producer in your own right. Do you ever see Brett? Yeah. I get on great with him now, and I see him whenever I can, yeah. Follow-up albums was presented by Pete Perfides, and the producer was Laura Parfit. It was a White Pebble Media production for BBC Radio 4.